I'd like to talk a bit now about some of the ideas of contesting worlds or contesting, contesting frames of reference within the novel. The first thing I'd like to mention is that Mina is empowered by her cultural hybridity. Cultural hybridity is when you have one element of one culture in your life and another element of you is another part of you is in another culture and they're brought together to make something altogether new. So you're made up of different cultural parts. Her being both Punjabi and British and second generation and someone from the Midlands and an older sister and a beloved daughter and granddaughter and um, um, a good wench, as the parents in the village would say. She's got all these different elements of her identity that come together to give her the sense of cultural hybridity. And within this cultural hybridity, Mina thrives. I'd like you to consider that, the way she's thriving, in contrast to the a lot of the white working class characters in the novel. They are monoculturally white. M the majority of them, we assume, only speak English, except there is one character we find out, Mr. Topsy Turvey, who's fluent in Punjabi, but we find that out later. It's a wonderful surprise in the novel. But otherwise, we assume they're monocultural, they speak English, they perhaps haven't really had a chance to travel much outside the country, even much outside the area. There's an assumption of a smallness of life and experience, which is reductive and unhelpful and possibly not true, but it's how Mina perceives the characters. What I'd like us to do, though, is step away for a bit. Let's contrast Mina and her family with Anita, for example, and her family. Remember, Anita's family has a little dog, a little poodle, with a dreadful name, a racist name, the N-word, for a name for a little poodle, which is utterly inappropriate. But neither Anita nor Tracy, her little sister, nor her mother Deidre seem to be aware that this is completely inappropriate. It's not acceptable. They don't seem to have the cultural awareness to realize that it's not okay to denigrate someone else for something as ridiculous as visible skin. Skin is not an accurate guarantor of interiority. We can't guarantee what someone's look, someone is like just by what they look like. And politically, this has been, this goes back again to Enoch Powell's Rivers of Blood speech that I mentioned kind of underpins the whole narrative. There's an awareness. Are people feeling that way? Do they reject what he said? Do they accept what they said? These fictional characters in the novel. Um, and this is what seems to be giving Mina a sense as she's in the building's room and as she's growing from innocence towards a bit more experience, there's even a scene where she wants to come home and tell her papa about the awful experience she had. Remember when she and her mom were driving, her mom's a new driver, but they were driving, the mom said, I want to take you to the Gudvara. I want you to have some spiritual training. You need this. So she takes Mina, but in driving, they come across some very steep hills. And the mother panics. Her, Mina's mother just panics and thinks, I can't do it. So she says, Mina, please ask the people to back up. I'll hit them. So she walks down to the other cars and says, hello, pardon me, please would you back up a bit? And there's a sweet little old lady who says foul, racist things to Mina. Mina is so shocked and so stunned by this. She goes back, doesn't tell her mother, but this is one of those moments of her her epiphanic moments, the great anagnoresis moments, that's what Aristotle would have called it, the bing, I recognize now what's going on. I, the scales have fallen from my eyes and I can see. She looks like a sweet little old lady, but the inside and the outside don't match. The inside is, she's racist. She's seeing, seeing me as a, a dirty little hmm. And she called me that and she said, she doesn't know me from anyone. She doesn't know my mother. So when Mina goes home, her craving is to go and sit in her papa's lap and tell him exactly what happened. But she looks up and sees his face and sees the wrinkles in his face, etched by possibly, Mina seems to be aware at that time, years of racist comments, racist abuse, micro-racisms, microaggressions that perhaps have been just forgotten, sloughed off, but they still leave a scar. And she sees in his eyes there's still hope. And she thinks, I can't be the one to destroy his hope. So she swallows it down. She doesn't say anything. I'm not suggesting it's a good idea to always swallow down, but this is where we see the development of a character from innocence going towards experience. She realizes what I've just experienced today, my parents have probably experienced a hundred times, a thousand times. I need to grow up and put on my big girl pants and deal with this. So that's just one of the examples. Though Mina is happy, I mentioned, in her cultural hybridity, there's also a sense that 
she, there is a sense of otherness, and it's very difficult for her to locate quite where she belongs in the wider context of 1960s Britain, where there is an inherently racist, but it's not necessarily seen as racist. It's seen as, well, we've got to protect ourselves, haven't we? Sort of way of thinking for many people. Um, there's a quote from chapter two that will help us to understand this. In the village, I was stuck between the various gangs, too young for Anita's consideration, too old to hang around the cloud of toddlers that would settle on me like a rash every time I set foot outside my young door, or my front door, pardon me. Not only is she between worlds age-wise, between cultures, thinking in my English and my Punjabi, where do I belong, how do I fit in? She also is trying to make sense of the tensions between her parents' expectations of her as first-generation migrants and what she expects of herself and what her community, her youth community expects of her, how they expect her to be cool and to, to be able to fit in and to become one of the dream gang and the Tullington wenches, the wenches brigade. She longs for the approval of her parents and for her extended family of aunties and uncles, which is completely understandable, but even more, she craves Anita's friendship. She's desperate to have Anita see her as one of the gang, and she really wants to be included. And because of this, the first real encounter that she knows about, about Anita, but the first real encounter we come to as readers is when nine-year-old Mita meets 13-year-old Anita, and there's a shadow on Mina's little T-bar strap sandals. And Anita comes over and asks her what she's doing. Now remember, this is in the first bit of the book, after Mina has stolen the sweets from Mr. Omeron's shop. No, sorry, she hasn't stolen them. She stole the money from her mother's purse to take that money, the shilling, to go to Mr. Omeron's shop and to buy these sweets. And her papa wants to know, Mina, did he give you those sweets? Or did you steal the money from your mother's bag to buy them? And she's like, no, 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 I didn't steal anything, Papa. <coughs> finally, though, the scene carries on, and she finally, right at the last moment, says, I was lying, Papa. And her father walks away in disgust. And then so she's sitting on the porch, and she's so dejected and depressed and embarrassed. And then Anita Rutter comes over, almost like a saving angel coming in to rescue her. But of course, Mina instinctively knows that Anita's bad news for her. She's a bad girl, and she won't be doing, um, won't re really be helping her. There's a quote that shows to me how she regards Anita at this time. This is from chapter three. I was happy to follow her a respectable few paces behind, knowing I was privileged to be in her company. Anita was the undisputed cock of the yard. Maybe that should be Hen, but her foghorn voice, foul mouth, and proficiency at lassoing victims with her frayed skipping rope indicated she was carrying enough testosterone around to earn the title. I love that quote. It really shows us um, things, that it comes to binaries that are being interrogated, gender binaries of he, she, binaries of us, them, binaries of good, bad. They're being interrogated, challenged, and dissolved with just this single quote here. Dis despite Mina's craving to be part of that accepted group, the close posse of Anita's friends, and the of course the title of the novel shows us how important this is, there's something that will always be separating them. Mina's not aware of it at the time. It's class, it's expectations of what's possible for people from different genders, so gender expectations, and the idea of the social and cultural expectations her family has for her. We get the idea then as readers watching this scene, wow, Mina in the future is likely to have choice. Anita in the future is likely to have less choice. It's painful and poignant for Mina to realize, and it's even more painful and poignant for us as readers to come across this awareness. It sort of hits us in the gut when we read that bit. Chapter three goes on with another description from Mina's point of view. I would watch the wenches strolling around the yard, feet dragging along in their mother's old slingbacks, and physically ache to be with them. Though Mina's sense of belonging is never fully realized when it comes to these Tollington kids, she knows, though, that when she's home, she is completely loved, completely adored. Um, there's even a, a situation where they're having a Diwali 
celebration for her family. And by the way, Anita is so jealous when she says, well, what is this Diwali? And she says, well, it's like another Christmas. <gasps> you get two Christmases then. Anita says, oh, you're so lucky. You're so lucky. It's at this, it's one of these celebrations when her papa, who is known for being an amazing singer, um, Mina listens to him and she begins to realize some of the significance of the difference between her home life and Anita's home life. This is a quote from chapter five. Papa's singing always unleashed these emotions, which were unfamiliar and instinctive at the same time, in a language I could not recognize but felt I could say in my sleep, in my dreams, evocative of a country I'd never visited, but which sounded like the only home I had ever known. The songs made me realize that there was a corner of me that would be forever not England. Let's consider the scene when Mina is trying to impress her parents' friends with her rendition of a pop song, because they say, Mina, sing for us. And so she proudly goes to sing it, and then they ask her about the song, and she ends up parroting the vulgar words that he'd, she'd heard Anita say when they went out to the fair, when she was talking to the, the fairground boys. <sighs> and she says, I won't say it now, it's in the novel, and her parents listen. I, Mina doesn't understand what she said when she says, oh, I love that song. I could, mm -mm 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 -mm. We can remember that from the novel. And there's a stunned silence. In chapter five, it goes on. There was a ter sudden terrible intake of breath and then complete silence, broken only by the harmonium, emitting a death rattle as Papa's fingernails fell off the keys. This was Mina's desperate attempt to fit into Anita's brash world, but she didn't realize the significance of what she was saying. She didn't realize that in trying to go into Anita's inner circle, she would possibly be ostracizing herself from the home life and the family and extended family that gave her such a strong sense of security.